So it's now 10 o'clock. Welcome to the Packet Hacking Village Talks. Um, thank you so much for starting your day and your morning in DEF CON with us here. So if this is, um, if this is, I see a lot of you folk here, this is your first time here at DEF CON. And so you have to, you may be asking, what, what do we do here at the Packet Hacking Village? Like, what, what's our mission? Our mission here at the Packet Hacking Village is on security education. It's to inform people and to, to awareness on a variety of broad range of items in security. And uh, on a personal note, for me, when I first started, as I said earlier, as when I first started coming to DEF CON in 2006, um, the Wall of Sheep and the, well, which is now the Packet Hacking Village, gave me all the foundation that, um, on like networking and security that I never got out of college. So that's our mission here is on security education. And for the whole duration at DEF CON, we will have a number of events um, and learning out, uh, activities at the, at the other end of the hall. But without much ado, uh, to kick it off our talks today, we have a fantastic talk that epitomizes the spirit of what we do in security education. And when we were actually uh, doing the CFP, we looked at the talk and I was like, this talk got to start off, um, start off the Packet Hacking Village talks. And without much ado, I want to give the warmest and warmest welcome to Tom Kopchek and Dan Borges of uh, National CPTC. So Ming, thank you so much for the opportunity and for the warm welcome. It's a privilege and an honor to be here and have the opportunity to speak to everyone. So thank you so much. And we have a lot of exciting stuff to share with you in this talk about the crazy things that we do uh, that consume all of our lives when we're not working and a lot of our lives when we are working. So yeah, absolutely. Without uh, that, let's get started. So. All right, guys, so we have a lot to cover today. Uh, first, we're going to start is what is the National Collegiate Pen Testing Competition, CPTC, and really what makes it different from a traditional CTF? Uh, traditional CTFs are very technically focused, and you're going to see we are technically focused, but there's so much more to this competition. And then we're going to get into some of the technical details. How did we put this all together and uh, build this amazing competition year after year? Yeah, and then we're going to go into some of the technical detail about how we hack together this competition, what we do to build the environment and make it interesting for everyone who's competing. And then we'll talk a little bit about the data that we collect and how we contribute to the research community at a whole. And we're going to end the whole thing with a call to arms. We're really trying to get a lot of people involved. Um, this is a product of the community. Like Kind of like Ming said, we're trying to further education, and we really want to get that feedback from the community. Um, so what is CPTC and like why is it different than a, a traditional CTF? Uh, like just from a mile high, a traditional CTF focuses on technical skills. There's usually an objective and a very clear challenge and you have to do some kind of hack to get through and uh, deliver that flag or whatever. In CPTC, it's much more open-ended. We have tons of vulnerabilities and it's how you express those and communicate those to the client that makes it different. Yeah, so how many of you have done a CTF before? Okay, that, that's good. I know that I see some people who've competed in CPTC before, so welcome. Uh, the thing that we really try to make this is different than a CTF, and we're going to go into a lot of detail as the things that we do that make this more relevant. But the formula that we have on this slide is really something that I like that captures the spirit of CPTC. We take offensive security. We use pen testing as the vehicle to teach security. We build a custom environment with custom tools and custom products and even commercial products as well to replicate a business. Add in the business element, not just the technical, but the non-technical aspects, and then you get CPTC. So that's our formula, and it's worked really well for teaching the skills that we're hoping to do. So just a little bit about us, like why are we up here uh, talking about this? Um, for CPTC, uh, I'm a director of the OSINT and the World. You'll see what that means later, but we try to make this as holistic and realistic as possible. Uh, in real life, I'm a senior internal red teamer, so I have experience doing this and delivering this kind of uh, information to clients. And then for me within CPTC, I run the white team, which is basically the rules and making the competition exist sort of group. I work with a couple other members of the advisory board as the core group to build the competition and direct how it's going to operate. 
And then I also run the uh, monitoring team where we collect data uh, for research purposes. And in real life, I direct a team of uh, Splunk implementation engineers at uh, Hurricane Labs in Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, the common theme that I really like between Dan and me is we both have the opportunity to work with clients in our real job. We have to be able to explain things that are technical to non-technical people. And also, really, the things that we do in real life apply directly to what we do in the competition. Now, it's not just us. There's a two of us here and a much larger village that makes up the entire competition. So this is a, a picture of some of our advisory board that works together to make this competition happen each year. And as we've said before, there are a lot of crazies that build this together and dedicate a ton of time to make it happening. And then on the uh, competitor side, we have tons of schools that play, and every year we get more. So there's 50 plus schools that are registered right now for the 2019 season, and we're actually expanding uh, internationally. So we have some schools in Dubai registered as well. Um, the regionals are massive. I think last year we had to host uh, upwards to like 30 concurrent environments. So it, it gets each school that plays gets their own environment. Yeah, and the other thing I'll say is, as of right now, we're waitlisting pretty much every region except New England. So if you know anyone who can get to University of New Haven who wants to compete, there's still some spots available. But otherwise, the waitlist is pretty much the only option. And we're looking at expanding that and handling it more better next year. But to get to the meat of the talk, uh, you're, at this point, you're probably wondering a little bit more detail about the competition. So let's get welcomed in by the uh, Stanford team that won last year. Uh, that are pictured here on the slide. So, why does CPTC exist, Dan? Go. So, CPTC uh, was actually the brainchild of Bill Stackpole and uh, Bob Kafka, and this was about, what, five years ago they thought this up, and there was just this need in the industry to address offensive security as well as uh, teach like more of a holistic approach to security. Yeah, and the big thing that we wanted to do is find a way to take industry experience and turn it into a relevant event that everyone can learn from. So the advisory board has been the core group in turning this into something that really reflects reality and what we deal with professionally. And then we also wanted to make this competition something that wasn't just small. We wanted it to be something that could expand. And as we've grown, including this year, we've grown internationally. So it started a couple people who showed up in Rochester in the middle of October, which is a beautiful place to be. And it, it's expanded to five concurrent regionals in the U.S., one in Dubai, and then an international competition of the top teams. So I know I asked how many of you have done a CTF, and that was pretty much the whole group. So CPTC is different. It's not a CTF. Uh, in fact, it's a competition in name only to the point where teams compete, but the goal that we want everyone to win from is to learn something and to be better prepared in the industry. So we have awards that we give out that are specifically for highlighting things that teams do well or relevant skills that we want to teach. So they don't necessarily know they're competing for that, uh, but we like to highlight things that teams do. Additionally, when you're interacting in the competition environment, we don't want you to talk about it being a competition. In fact, if a team says something to one of us, like in this competition, we're like, what do you think? This is some kind of game? We'll talk about how in character and out of character behavior happens. But our emphasis is when you're working with a client, you're not going to be referring to that as a competition because why are they competing to try to break into your domain controller? That's not appropriate. That's not how you handle it in business. Yeah, like Tom says, the the things we score aren't direct uh, like flags or, or hard results in a traditional CTF. What you do is you find the technical vulnerabilities and it's how you present those to the management team that really makes the difference, uh, which we don't normally see in CTFs. Yeah, exactly. And CPTC really should be a professional consulting engagement where you are hired by a client to perform a pen test, deliver a report to your management, and also work with them to get the problems fixed. So you're doing a security assessment for a real-ish company that we create. And the important thing is it's not, you know, your smash and grab, try to score as many points as you can sort of scenario. If you find every single vulnerability, spoiler alert, you won't. But if you do, you won't win necessarily because you still have to communicate that clearly. And it's really the good analogy that we have for this is you're performing surgery on the network. You are a doctor. You're working with a patient. You can't kill the patient. You have to try to fix the problems with the patient and make sure they still live to t tell another tale the next day. 
<clears throat> so again, how are we different than a normal CTF? Our uh, machines don't have single vulnerabilities. We put multiple vulnerabilities in each machine and then the machines are all interconnected. So there's not one attack path that lets you own the network. There's multiple attack paths. And what really makes CPTC different is showing how the vulnerabilities in these systems not only can be used to like get domain admin, for example, but can be used to a leverage against the goals of the business. So you'll see we have uh, very goal oriented competitions like the business will be a, a voting company or a self driving car company. And how can you impact that business model, not just take over all the machines? Yeah, exactly. And the vulnerabilities that we put in here are not necessarily always planned. And I would say we spend less time these days actually trying to come up with a attack scenario as opposed to just having realistic problems built in. So like we may have weak passwords that exist. We may have configuration issues. There may be configurations issues that allow you to get access to a system that allow you to find more information that you can use somewhere else. So we build in some of that, but there is just a ton of vulnerabilities. So we guarantee that all the teams will not, even not one specific team will be able to find everything because we won't be able to find everything. And teams need to understand the significance of the environment and what each system is doing during the event. We don't tell them what the significance is. You walk into a company, you have to figure out what's important. You know what the business does, but you don't necessarily know why each system is there. So you have to figure that out as you're doing your assessment. And then when you ultimately present to your executives and give that reasoning as to why this is important, why you should care, you do have to consider the risk to the company. And that's something that a CTF doesn't often capture. And the other thing is teams have to consider that they are operating in a business environment that's doing something and is pro producing whatever that company is doing. So like when we did the election theme, there were elections that were running. You couldn't take down the servers that were collecting votes because then there's not going to be votes that are collected. Uh, same thing for the autonomous vehicles. If you cause a car to crash, that's really bad for the company. So you don't want to do that. So teams have to consider their impact to the business. And that's something that you don't have to do in most CTFs. But as Dan, you can definitely say, when you're doing internal red teaming, you can't break the company you're testing. Oh, that, it matters so much. You don't understand this stuff until you get into the real world, but the relationships between these people at these companies matters more than the vulnerabilities. Um, that said, we do have technical vulnerabilities. We have a ton of them. The competition really is split 50-50. Half of it is technical. Um, if you compete, you'll probably want to take a picture of this because these are like real. And you'll see, you see the host column. We have multiple ways into each system. Um, and then these systems are all interconnected. So you might get creds from one system and then move laterally to another. Uh, and that's, that's the goal, right? Show us how you exploit the, the environment. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I, I see some of you are taking pictures. The CIA did get a hold of this slide ahead of time, so uh, some of that's a little bit redacted. But it gives you a general idea of how we break this down, where we have hosts that are having various vulnerabilities and services that are configured incorrectly. And a lot of this we actually build as teams are producing their reports. So we have an idea of what's messed up and what we planned out. But teams will find things that we don't necessarily plan on being there. We have a test environment. We'll evaluate it and make sure it's actually a real vulnerability and then add it to the scoring system because, you know, just because we don't expect something to be found, not a problem with that. So the other thing that we really find important to teach is soft skills. And as we've said, technical is not everything for this competition. Uh, the team deliverables are as important as the findings themselves. And that's the way we design the scoring, and that's absolutely by design. So the reports, we score them based on how the findings are presented, how you relate that risk to the business, and how you, you know someone who's a manager can identify this is important, these are the things that I need to present to my team, as well as how well you explain and help the technical people fix those problems, because that's what you want in a good pen test report. And then we also do presentations. So at the, at the national event, and even actually at the regional events now, teams need to give a presentation to an executive team. And they need to talk about how it's, you know, the, the things that they find in the environment are relevant to that team. And we think about that from the perspective of you're walking into someone that, you hi that had hired you to perform a security assessment, and how do you approach that? 
if you do something and say like, boy, your IT team really sucks, you know, your customer is not going to like that. And those are sorts of things that we take into account when you're giving that presentation. And I love the fact that we bring in industry professionals to do that. Yeah, that's. I was just going to note, uh, we get a bunch of volunteers, and then those create the executive board for the presentations. So it's it's not even us creating the presentations. It's people from the industry that you know get these presentations delivered to them often. Um, and then we look to them for feedback, too. And the other thing that we added, and we'll, we'll talk about this on the next slide, but we actually have the coaches participate as well in part of the scoring. So we have mechanisms to ensure that there's fairness for that and you know they're not skewing scores in favor of their team. But we wanted one coach came to us and said, hey, we want to get learn more about what teams are doing so we can teach this better in the classroom. And I'm like, absolutely, let's make this work. And an hour later, it was part of the competition. Yeah. So like we said, education, that's our goal. Um, I would say actually only one team can win. We understand that, but every team can learn. And that's absolutely our goal. And as Ming said, that's the spirit of the packet hacking village where we all are here to learn something. And CPTC absolutely tries to do that. Yeah. And, you know, we've been talking about business all this time, but we absolutely try to teach technical skills through this competition. Even the volunteers, like I learned something every year I do this. Uh, we build new tooling and we always push ourselves and we push uh, students. Sometimes we even have like tiers of the environment. So we'll have like easy network and then it gets harder and harder. Um, so I think there's really something for everyone to learn here, both on the soft side and the technical side. Yeah, absolutely. And really the fundamental thing, as I've been saying, is you're learning how to be a consultant and work with clients. And nothing else that we've been able to find provides that experience to people who are in a collegiate learning environment. So I've had, even, even walking up here on the elevator, someone who competed in CPTC stopped us and said it was the best experience that we had learning how to do this and prepared me for the real world. And I just love hearing that feedback because it means we're, we struck a chord and we're doing something right. And we just want to keep on making this better. So to kind of move on to the next section, let's chat a little bit about what we do to build this environment, how we hack it together and what we do to make the environment realistic and also pretty complicated. So so I kind of mentioned this before, but the business goals drive a lot of the infrastructure. Um, so in 2015, we were just kind of getting started. We had a corporate network. We had a production network uh, and a f like some several web apps. Uh, 2016, we really started getting thematic. So we did healthcare, and their high availability is the point of the systems. We had to maintain confidence. Uh, patient confidentiality and then high availability of the systems. From there, we moved on to elections. Elections was actually pretty funny because uh, we made a mistake, and I think every team got domain admin within like the first few hours. Um, which, yeah, like that sucks for us, but that's also kind of realistic. Like sometimes that happens. Pen test team comes in and they just roll the environment in the first few hours. So the the, the reason for that is we screwed up our build and didn't clear bash history, <laughs> but. That's something that you would find in an environment, and although we didn't plan on it, it was something that happened. That said, the teams that took that and did a lot with domain admin were the ones that were very successful. The teams that said, hey, we got domain admin, yay, look at us, they could have done a lot more. Yeah, it, it was such an interesting year because now every team had domain admin, right? So the the playing field was leveled and it all, all of a sudden it became, well, how can you impact the business? What can you do with all that access you have? Um, and elections, that was very difficult because we had all kinds of cryptographic verification. So they had access to all the systems, but now they had to start analyzing crypto systems. Um, and then last year we did autonomous vehicles, which is the wheels company. Um, and that was just this crazy set of microservices where you had, you know, these small little services shooting network data all around to each other. And the students had to figure out that kind of microservice architecture. Yeah, so uh, now we'll get to this year. So we've been spending an insane amount of time coming up with this. Uh, in fact, we had a meeting over dinner the night of the 2018 national conclusion where we started planning this out, debated it internally for quite some time. Uh, almost every flight that me and some of the other advisory board members have been on, we've been writing up drafts because we can't find time to do this any other time. But we've been spending a ton of time working on this and trying to build something that's relevant and coming up with ideas that are appropriate years in advance, not necessarily years in advance, but months and months in advance. I think what we've chosen, especially given recent news, is very appropriate. 
Now, I'd say we had nothing to do with the recent news, so don't blame us for that. But here we go. Dino Bank will be our 2019 theme. In fact, uh, we have a logo. But uh, we'll give you a little bit of information about Dino Bank, but we think this is something that's going to be incredibly relevant and expose students to an aspect that, quite frankly, security needs to be improved in for a lot of industries, as we've seen with uh, some companies that have faced some issues recently. So so if, if you've ever done pen testing, you may have done some kind of PCI consulting uh, or some kind of financial industry pen testing. And that's the goal here, is we want to get students this experience that dominates so much of the field. Uh, so Dino, Dino Bank is going for their memorandum of understanding. Um, they are trying to become an official bank, and they need a pen test to do this, and then they need to remediate their vulnerabilities and, you know, basically have a clean bill of health. Um, that's what we are, we want to bring the students in to do that financial pen test for this bank. And we, we've seen incredible growth in this event. So we added an international region in Dubai in 2019, and uh, we're looking to continue expanding that to larger yeah, opportunities and involving more schools and we want ultimately everyone to have an opportunity to compete in this if they're interested so we're going to find a way to make that happen that all said we're actually already working on 2020 and planning that out and we're partnering with a major company who's dedicating people to help produce it so this is going beyond just the crazies of us who take our experience to actual companies that are dedicating resources and full-time people to help us build the environment. So that's all I can say right now, but we're planning on making it the most awesome and interactive environment yet for 2020 as well. So more to come and it'll be exciting. So we kind of talked uh, earlier about like technically what goes into these environments. Uh, Alex and I talked about a tool last year at B-Sides LV called LaForge. Basically these environments are so complex that we had to generate custom tooling. Um, LaForge is a really interesting tool, and you can go back to that talk, but essentially what it does is it allows us to design one competition environment, and then we can scale that up for X number of teams. So we can build one environment and then kind of deploy that for everybody. Um, and then here you see not only do we have rich networks with interconnected uh, uh, hosts that you know transfer data between each other, but we have apps that rely on each other, and that's kind of the voting components there and you see a little bit of a microservice architecture where these apps are shooting data back and forth. Um, and then not only do we have fake, uh, not fake, but infrastructure, we have people. So we generate hundreds and hundreds of fake employees. Um, some of them we role play as during the competition, but the majority of them are just going to be like data or employees of this company that make it look and feel real. Yeah, one of the things I really liked about the this 2017 voting app stack is just the layers of complexity that exist in there. So teams thought that they could modify votes by just looking at where they were initially recorded. And yes, that was basically a database server that was very unprotected. But what they didn't necessarily dig into is some of the cryptographic signing that we did. Now, it was a terrible, terrible cryptographic signing mechanism based on like RGB colors or something ridiculous. But that was something that I think one team actually managed to figure that out. Yeah, somebody wrote uh, the hashing algorithm. And, and that, was, that was awesome to see them dig into that and really see what we did. So a lot of this stuff is something you can figure out, but we want to try to make it something you just scratch the surface. There's a lot more to it. Yeah. And that really helps us differentiate the teams in terms of how good they are at sorting out complex problems that we throw at them. Let's just say you wanted to build a CPTC environment. To help you out, we created this simple diagram to explain what goes into one of our environments. But uh, this is actually from LaForge. The, the complexity here is unreal. This is a graph of all of the objects uh, at the end of a LaForge build. Uh, really at the top is where we design the competition, and then the tools scale this out. And this is just like, at the end of the day, we have hundreds of thousands of objects in AWS, and they're all related. And we couldn't build it without tooling. Um, so here's an object model that the tool generated when we were done to show you the complexity of these environments. Yeah, so if you're a human, you might find this a little bit more understandable. Uh, this is a diagram from our 2017 event, and you can see there's multiple networks. We have a mix of Linux and Windows hosts. 
they're all doing different sorts of services and they interact in different ways. And some of these networks you have to get through from openings in other hosts. So like you may only have access to the networks on the left side initially until you get a foothold in one and are able to get into the networks on the right side. So yeah, like some of my favorite techniques is a pen test or a lateral movement. So you may find a vulnerability on one system and you can't get into another system. But if you could reuse creds and laterally move, then all of a sudden you have white box access to that system and you may find vulnerabilities in source code or something. Yeah, and then separately, one of the things that we do besides the technical side is the world. And Dan has done some amazing work on building this and making it something that is really a signature element of the competition, I think. And we spend a lot of time making the comp company exist. Uh, we have social media that we create for the company's employees, just like you would if they were a real company. And then we seed the environment with all types of information that can be used to help the teams out. So. Yeah, this is my baby. This is the world building team started as an OSINT team where basically three months before the competition, we wanted to build out all these personas and then put them online and let students do OSINT and research this company and start to build this idea of what they were going to be attacking. Um, and we just took that to the extreme. We made these people uh, so realistic that then we started role playing them in the competition. We started adding like uh, storylines. Like I think last year we had an insider threat scenario. So and, and the pen testers discover this as they go through things. They find logs. They're like, hey, this isn't right. There's malware on this box. And then they start to put together this like story that we're building. And they're like, oh, I, I think this guy is planting malware in your environment. Um, so it's, it's really cool stuff. And the, the other thing I'd add is we found in a lot of CTFs, you might have like a wiki server that just runs media wiki without any content in there. It's like, so you get into the wiki server, but oh, well, our wikis have content that you can use to understand how systems operate. They might have details about configurations that you won't find anywhere else. And you can use that to piece together on another attack path or get some more information about context for the systems. So we have a lot of things that help give teams some ideas about what to do. And then they can run with that and discover some more interesting vulnerabilities or issues. Uh, so like we were saying, we build these stories. Um, on the left here, you can see uh, one of our OSINT stories where we set up an entire fake online forum, like hacks forums or something. And then we had guys uh, basically leaking PII and intellectual property to this forum that we created. Uh, kind of talking smack on the company, thinking they were the brains, and you know the company's no good, and they could do it themselves. So you start to build this story before you ever come into the competition. That like, hey, you guys have data leaking on the internet. You know something, something's not right here. Um, and then on the right, you can see that they do leak their API endpoints. They do start leaking documentation. And one of the other goals here is we're giving the students something to research before they get into the competition. So the idea is they're not coming in blindsided. They kind of know some of the technology that'll be in place. They kind of have a good idea how to hack it before they get there. Yeah, it was actually really cool. I had the opportunity to stop by where Stanford does their team meetings and they had on the wall like printouts of our stuff that we put out there and like lines between. It was awesome to see that. And I'm like, yep, that's right, that's right. You missed that one. <laughs> and <laughs> just kind of piecing that all together. So that was a good time. Um, also, we sometimes produce applications with custom APIs and sometimes actually remember to document it. And sometimes if we remember to document, we find these weird endpoints that we put in our APIs, like something that'll just arbitrarily run whatever command you want, which is a nice feature. But, you know, it's not unlike normal IoT firmware where things are just horribly broken. So, yeah, backdoors exist and we will create them into our app sometimes and teams get to discover them. And then, uh, like we were saying before, these apps are all richly interconnected. So uh, here you have a database host, but the database actually supports uh, chat for another application. Um, so you know the students have two ways to get to the information. They can either log into the chat server, directly access messages, or they can hack the database and get to the messages that way. And like in the case of the uh, wheels environment, we had databases that were full of car data that you were able to just find. And like that is personal information. That shouldn't be something that someone on your network can just get to. Uh, likewise, our emails actually contain emails. 
And those emails have information and stories about the company that you can get some more information from. And then, Chad, I, I, I love the stuff that you do with this, too. Yeah, in, in chat, like, again, as you get access to credentials and users, you will find more and more of the story. It'll start to unfold. And then uh, we also start to, like, create internal politics. So, you know, certain users are resistant to the pen test. They don't really want it to happen. Other users are kind of fighting for the pen test. They're championing the project. So that kind of matters as a pen tester who you're talking to in the company, right? Like, who has your back? Who really wants you there? Um, and we, we think that stuff matters. Yeah, so next we want to talk a little about the role playing that we do. So it's not just teams show up and they do a pen test and don't have anyone to interact with. Dan, me, other members of the advisory board all play roles in this environment, and students are expected to interact with us as if we were industry professionals or maybe not industry professionals, but customers. Uh, And that is something that you don't get exposure to outside of this competition. But it's modeled based on what we experience in real life at our jobs. So we interact with students in character uh, throughout the event. So we'll walk into students' rooms like we're the director of the security or if we're i don't even remember what you've been the past couple years but director of incident response and they've triggered some alert and i come in screaming is this you or you know is this us (laughs) yeah so you know i i think let's do a uh, run through of what this looks like Uh, okay so you're going to be director of whatever you want to be i'm going to be a pen tester okay so okay I'm packing away. Hey. Because that's what you do. I don't have the ski mask on, so. Hey. You what do you want? Did you guys attack the dot seven system? Uh, no, that wasn't us. Are you, are you sure it just went offline and we're just trying to make sure that, you know, it's it's nothing on the network? No, hey. no, no, no. That's not us. It's not us. Uh, okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's an example of a bad interaction. And we've seen that from teams. So let's do an example of another one. Okay. Talk, talk, talk. Hey. Hey, hey, what's up, Dan? Uh, we just had the dot seven system go offline. I think oh. it's, yeah, it's a, it's a patient system. We were just wondering, did you guys touch that? You know, let me check with the team. I'm not sure if that happened, okay. but is there someone on your team that's tracking that, that we can yeah. talk to? Yeah, you can just email us at our normal mail when you figure out, and then we can resolve the details of it. Okay, great. You know, I'm gonna have some of my team work on that to try to figure out what's going on. I don't know if that's us. I can't say if that's anything that's happened yet, but we're going to investigate it and we'll let you know what's going on. Thanks, So man. let's work together and get this resolved. Yeah, I really appreciate that. Awesome. Thank you. Cool. So that's an example of a good interaction. So <laughs> we've seen examples of both. So. Uh, and then we also try to have like physical competitions too. Um, so in this one, it was really cool. We, we brought all the students into a room and we had kiosks and they had to kind of like break out of the kiosks, which is always a, a fun competition. And then they could take it to like ad infinitum. Uh, the kiosks had a machine behind them. They could shell that machine, get callbacks to their room, like stay persistent in the kiosk network. Um, and, you know, some teams didn't even realize they could break out of the kiosk. Yeah, I really love the hands-on element of this. And there were teams that, you know, basically took the kiosk and had them being able to execute commands on that back in their room, and uh, some teams that didn't necessarily even realize that there was a separate operating system there. So I, I like the opportunity to expose students to something that's different and uh, kind of make it a little bit more complex than just a VM in the cloud somewhere. So bringing in the physical element, making you have to travel to on-site engagement, have a little bit more experience of what that entails and how you should prepare for it. <laughs> So next I want to uh, delve into a little bit of the competition data that we collect and our methodology for that and some of the research that we're driving behind that. So one of the big things we've been able to conclude is that hackers like typing LS. In fact, 13 some percent of the commands typed last year were LS. You can also see some people's favorite combinations of LS. Like (laughs) LSLA is more popular than LSAL. So these are very important contributions that we're making with the data that we collect. <laughs> there you go. We have, we have someone who feels very strongly about that. So, uh, you know, get, it, get a team, get them all to type it that way, and then you'll be able to change the future. So, <laughs> Joking aside, uh, some of the monitoring is some of my favorite stuff. Like we run uh, like Splunk alerts and then also like we collect like OS query data and we'll have like bash history. So we have this really rich monitoring in the observation room where we'll show like 
uh, commands that recent teams are running, um, not just like statistically prevalent stuff because that isn't the interesting stuff. Uh, but yeah, we'll do like, what is the best end map command? Who's generating the coolest payload? Like all kinds of weird stuff. Yeah, and we we actually uh, do a ton of monitoring in the environment, and it's for two purposes: competition integrity, and also for research. So after the competition ends, researchers are pulling over or pouring over the data set to get more information about how systems are attacked and what it's like to be on the attacking side and the targeting side, because we collect both sides. So some of the sample tools that we use, we have IDS on all the hosts, both on the attack side and on the defense side. Uh, we have Splunk Universal Forwarders everywhere, forwarding to a central environment, collecting data. We use OS Query, Sysmon, monitor log files, you name it, we'll collect it. And we try to make this entertaining. So we will provide real times graphs and uh, charts, kind of like the, the uh, Wall of Sheep does with credentials, yeah. but we want to see what's going on in the environment. So we use our tools to do that. Uh, one of the interesting things that we found actually, uh, just analyzing IDS alerts and how many are generated by each team, the winning teams at the bottom were actually the ones that generated the fewest amounts of IDS alerts. So that, that speaks a lot to us where you're not just scanning and generating a lot of noise in the network. You're identifying something and then you're actually digging into it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and this is a lesson that I've seen in, in real world pen testing. Um, Flailing doesn't really help you in pen testing, kind of wildly scanning, definitely information gathering and doing research, but then you really are ex executing ex like explicit exploits, very targeted, specific things. So throwing around tons of scans and data isn't going to really help you exploit an environment, other than recon. So the data set is public. Anybody can download past data sets and they can... Uh, do their own research. Uh, we just hope that you attribute it back to us. And then we are also doing research. So one of the things that our research team uh, devised is they basically found that the techniques that teams are using to access these box do map to the MITRE attack framework. And they are building full kill chains to kind of show this is how a team moved through the environment. Um, so that's ongoing research right now. Yeah, and uh, some of the stuff that I've seen is really awesome where they have actual log data from whatever host, like the host where the attack is run. So we see attacker runs this command, and then this results in this process being executed on this target system. And nothing else really provides the information of what an attacker is doing using log data, as well as what the target is receiving. Uh, plans for 2019 is to expand this even more and make it closer to all of our development processes, where everything that can produce a log will get logged and grabbed. And then I'm hoping to make the data set that's publicly available next year actually have frozen Splunk data that you can just put into a Splunk instance and run your own searches on as well. So that's the long-term goal, to make that really something that's accessible to anyone who wants to do this sort of research and make CPTC the vehicle where we can do that. Yeah, and then we've also released our tools. So LaForge is open source uh, if you want to check that out and try and build a, a similar competition. And we've talked about... Uh, releasing LaForge config files so that way teams can stand up their own environments. It hasn't been something that we've gotten to yet, but every year we really push for that. And one of these years we're going to have like a plug-and-play environment that schools can stand up on their own. Yeah, exactly. And, and the other thing that we've done is we're trying to have teams contribute more to the uh, just the general security community as a whole. So one of the new additions in the 2019 rules is actually allowing teams to stage their own tools in a repository that we provide. They have to be able to explain how these tools work, they have to have them documented, and they have to be able to make them something that other teams are able to use and other industry professionals are able to use. But we want to remove the veil of secrecy for a lot of this. We want teams to be able to make contributions to the security community and use CPTSC as the vehicle to do that. And uh, if anyone wants to do any work with the data set, you're definitely encouraged to do so. The only thing you, we ask is that you at least attribute it to us as where you got the data. Cool. So we're just going to cover some quick success stories. Uh, this is really the point of the competition is the students, and it's the people coming out of it. And we've had so many amazing people come through this program. Uh, so we're just going to kind of rapid fire through these and... and uh, highlight some of this. And again, the whole point of this is for education. We're trying to get more people into the field. These are people that are already passionate about it. Um, and we're just trying to guide them to, you know, be more successful when they leave school. 
Yeah, and actually, going just going back to that, we saw a need, and talking to people in industry, we saw that there are opportunities that people need to have to learn the skills that employers demand, and a lot of students come out of college very strong on the technical skills, but they don't have an opportunity to learn the business skills, especially in a lot of the technically focused programs. And just having a bunch of students walk up to me and say CPTC was the best thing that I did in college, that's just awesome. And we hear that quite a bit. And everything that we're trying to do is supporting education and make things better and make students better at what they do. So we've had students land jobs through CPTC, and quite a number of them have said, just this alone was what I was able to say is the, the big experience that got me that. And then uh, Stanford's team actually reported a zero day in a real application, uh, and they were working on getting that resolved. But uh, it's a great example of something that we definitely didn't plan in being in the environment that we were able to reproduce once they told us what they found. And that's a, another good example of good reporting, where looking at the report, we, w we were able to understand what the issue was and validate it in our environment. So, to wrap up, call for action. Yeah, uh, this is really only possible because of volunteers. Like we saw, we're passionate about this stuff, and we saw the need, and we know there needs to be more people in the industry. So we commit our time to trying to teach and make this uh, better. And really, we need more people. Like it's Tom and I and a handful of other people, and we could really use volunteers. We have so much work, um, and it's such a good cause. So. If anything here struck a chord with you, uh, please reach out to us. And, you know, there's just tons of work to do. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, call for action. Be an influence in helping the next wave of cybersecurity professionals. Uh, help support us if you think that you're able to do it. Start a team. Encourage students that you know to become involved or compete. Uh, we're also looking for people to help us run this year's event not only from a helping build the environment to also helping with the, some of the scoring that we need to do and the grading and all of that because it's a pretty big undertaking. Yeah. So. And as you've seen, there's, there's a place for everybody at all, all levels, right? Like we have non-technical positions, we have technical positions. Um, so really anybody can help. And that's what it's all about is collecting that industry experience and trying to put that into the competition. Yep, absolutely. So I'll leave this last slide up with our contact info. We have a form on the website for sponsors if you're interested in, not, not sponsors, but for volunteers. You know, sponsors, too, if you want. But <laughs> you can reach out to any of us. Additionally, we're going to be speaking with a bigger panel of the advisory board at Ethics Village at 4 o'clock on Saturday, so tomorrow. And we're going to di dive into some of the ethical issues that we've run into while we're teaching pen testing and have a wider panel discussion with our group as well as having more audience participation. So if you like what you see and want to learn more, stop by there. If not, we'll open the floor for questions. I also have CPTC stickers up here if you want to grab any of those. But uh, thank you all. So the question was, for those of you who didn't hear, there's a lot of custom I information and artifacts of data that exist in the environment. How is it created? So uh, a good amount of it is hand-generated right now. We set up the systems in advance, and then we kind of enter the data, and then we scale that across all the teams. But we do uh, clone like a bunch of pages or documentation if we're trying to build documentation very fast. And then things we're getting into this year uh, on the World and OSINT team is we're starting to get into like deep fakes and creating images of people, putting those like totally, like normally we, we go and we steal images or whatever, but totally unique creative images and then putting those like in places with other people. Um, and then same, if we could ever do that with docs and generate real-ish enough docs that are relevant, because what I don't want to do is just have tons of red herrings, right? I want it to be re relevant. But great question. Great question. Thank you. And the other thing we have to sort of kind of deal with is there are personas that we create for us. So like I have an identity in the environment that's not my real identity, but it still is a version of Tom, for example. And Dan has the same sort of thing. So we have to create a separate persona that we can use in the environment and play that in character, but we don't want you to also be like confused by our real job, so to speak. So, yeah. 
So the question there was, how do students land jobs through CPTC? So we have a lot of industry sponsors that help us either through providing expertise, volunteers, or dollars. And they have opportunities to interact with the students as part of the competition. So they, some of them will have the opportunities to interact as a role player in the environment. And they actually get to see the students operating professionally or watching presentations. But we also have career fair type things where teams have a couple hours to meet with the sponsors and have conversations like that. It's, it's not like, it's not a competition in the sense that that's why we throw it. We throw it for education, but man, the winning teams, like the second they get off that, uh, like podium or announcement, there's the vol the sponsors come up to them, offering them jobs. It's, it's pretty insane. So I, I think I saw, so the question there was, have we thought about deploying a version of this as a honeypot? So great idea <laughs> yeah I, I, now we have <laughs> um, that, that's a really good idea and um, especially with the data that we're collecting I think that could be really awesome it's it's very expensive to run all the infrastructure yeah you have like our daily burn rate so so we have had to secure so our cloud provider that we use is very much dependent on what cloud provider gives us enough money <laughs> uh, so we switch between amazon and google and other just depending on what's available but i think actually lucas you could probably tell us an answer on this but it's probably like five to ten thousand dollars a day for a region yeah. so it, it, obviously that's it, if it's sponsor money it's monopoly money to us but we still got to be responsible about that so um, but we're also looking at the ability to take this and maybe you throw it on your own ESX server and use LaForge to build it. So you don't have that cloud cost. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it, it would be. <laughs> if anyone you know, uh, cloud providers that can give us a lot more dollars, you know, we can make that happen. <laughs> Yeah. So the question there was, when should teams start OSINT and when should they stop? Uh, so OSINT hasn't started yet this year. It will probably start around mid-August. I usually start after DEF CON. Um, and basically, you start stop probably the week before the competition. I like to have everything leaked the week before. Uh, but, you know, if we run late, it could be up to. Um, and there will always be some kind of technical finding. So there will always be something you can use in the environment. And it may even be a case that you don't necessarily know what a thing is called in the environment, like a custom tool, but you'll see something like that on a server, you'll see a web page for something, and then you can potentially Google that and get documentation for it. Or there might be another path to get that through social media as well. So the question for that was, have we had any success stories scaling the data set down to a high school or a nonprofit level? And I would say a lot of the research has been more generic right now uh, in terms of like business MITRE framework type stuff. That's a really interesting point. The, the thing I would say is probably a little bit more challenging is it's not necessarily designed to show a certain thing where... Uh, like some of the other exercises, you know, there's a clear path. You know something exists in the log file. A lot of times our researchers are taking a team's report, knowing they discovered something, and then trying to find that based on a much wider data set. So it's, it's probably more sophisticated than a lot of that. But I think once we identify examples and then maybe even write it up in a way like you can download this and find this sort of thing, that'll make it a little bit more accessible. But it's it's a a lot of data right now. So I think last year the raw data collected was like 350 gigabytes of data in like eight hours of competing time. So it's 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 quite a bit, and we're probably going to be seeing more than that this coming year. And then even analyzing that, like you have to stand up huge Splunk instances. Yeah. It, 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 so we yeah we we do use Splunk for analyzing the data. That makes it pretty easy. But we're trying to make that more accessible in where 
if you only want to look at a certain, like Windows logs, for example, we want to make it so you can just download that, throw it into Splunk, let it churn away, and then do something with it. So I think that approach is going to make it easier for, like, what you're saying, you know, high school level, college level, because if you're a college professor and you want to, you know, look at, teach students how to work with Windows logs when an attack is going on, you could download the CPTC Windows log index, index that into Splunk, run searches on that, do reporting, all that kind of stuff. So that's kind of my long-term vision for what we want to do this coming year. But I think that'll probably be something that could help for what you're looking to achieve. But yeah, uh, you know, hit us up or grab contact info here and uh, we can chat about maybe some ideas about that too. So the question on that was, what kind of resources do universities provide, and also how do they get uh, involved with this? So a lot of it's actually been word of mouth initially. Uh, so this started out with uh, a couple schools in the greater Rochester area or upstate New York. And then as people have talked about this experience, it has grown. And actually part of the reason we're talking here is to just get the word out there about what we're doing. And as more teams learn about that and have the opportunity to compete or at least know this exists, they're signing up. And we're looking at ways to make sure we handle that demand. Yeah, and in, in terms of uh, resources, uh, we've partnered with a numerous uh, universities, uh, specifically five in the U.S. and one in Dubai, to host our regional events. And they provide space uh, for a weekend for a regional event. They provide uh, meals and they help teams out, necessarily, uh, not necessarily financially, but at least getting them arrangements to show up and stay a weekend and compete. Uh, they provide us with people who can talk uh, or give presentations in the industry, and they also provide us with volunteers to staff the rooms, make sure teams know where to go, uh, make sure that it all operates smoothly. And then on the national CPTC side, we provide representatives from our organization to show up. Uh, they basically run the event for the school so they don't need to provide any of the setting up the environment sort of thing. They just need to provide labs. And they also we also provide all the infrastructure, all the scoring, and all of that to make it happen. So from a university perspective that's hosting it, yes, they have a, a lot of things that they need to do to make it happen, but it's not as serious as where they have to build infrastructure and all that. They, they use their lab space, they use their classroom space, and they provide food, more or less. And then the students that are competing, they provide the, you know, the willing and able bodies to stay up all night and write reports. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. So the, the question was, you, what tools do we provide to deploy this environment on its own? Yeah. So... Uh, we have a tool on GitHub slash genocide with a zero for, instead of the O, and then uh, LaForge. Um, and there's a B-sides uh, talk about it last year, but basically the idea is you can use that to build the environments. It takes YAML configuration files and like an API key for a cloud provider. Unfortunately, we don't have any of those YAMLs, like the example environments, because uh, we reuse them. So we just haven't like put out templates yet but that that is the dream like we've been talking about it for a few years and then maybe this year we're going to like retire a subset of systems and we could publish those yeah and we want to get to the point where like as you saw we're providing a lot of information about the 2017 environment because that's well past at this point uh we want to get to the point where we can release older environments and teams can use that for practice or qualifying type environments but right now it's pretty hard like we finally decoupled the tool and released the tool and now we're going to start to release environments Any okay. Yeah. Yeah. So the question was, do we? Uh, <laughs> is there a reason we use LaForge versus Terraform? And we actually do use Terraform, though. Yeah. So LaForge is just a custom Terraform wrapper, basically. Yeah. It, except it's like way complex and fancy and has a bunch of bells and whistles, but it's a Terraform wrapper. Yeah. It, it, it's custom designed to write Terraform in the way that we need to write Terraform to to build this environment. Um, so you mentioned the bash history debacle. Has the, have you ever made any other mistakes that have affected the entire course of the company? 
Oh, we screw up things all the time. Yeah. <laughs> so the question was, uh, have we made other mistakes that have affected the competition? There, you know, we are we are human. We do make mistakes, and like I'm trying to think of some notable. Yeah, we actually uh, in tw- last year announced the wrong winners. So the way we our scoring system was set up is you have teams one through whatever in each region, one through ten, and for whatever reason, there was a discrepancy between the way it was presented on one page in the scoring system versus how it was on the main page. And if you like updated the URL as opposed to going through web UI, you put the score in the wrong section. And there were teams that their score was good enough that it didn't look like they had a zero for part of the score when we sanity checked it. And then we realized when we started putting in the later time zone scores that they had scores already and something really bad happened. So we actually... Before we figured out exactly what we were going to do about it, we decided exactly, and this is actually going to play, you should go to Ethics Village, we're going to talk about this stuff too. But we decided that we were going to do the right thing and whatever team actually won would be what we announced, even if it changed the course of the event completely. Um, and then we figured out how that affected individual teams. So, And we, we there's a, a couple series of tweets that we have about this where we explain what happened and how we fixed it. But... Our emphasis is we are transparent about what we do. If we make mistakes, we admit it, and we don't want to hide anything about what we do. So, we make that, mistakes all the time. yeah, <laughs> we we, we do st- stuff like that happens, and that's what you deal with professionally. And we think that it's not making the mistake that's the thing; it's how you handle it. Yeah, excellent. so that's that's very important for what we do. So, uh, thank you so much, Ming. Yeah. We appreciate it, and thank you for all and stickers. Yeah. <laughs>